In last week's lectures, we dealt with the question of rockabilly and talked about um, uh, people like Elvis Presley as an important rockabilly artist, uh, although Elvis was a little bit broader than that, but other people like Carl Perkins, um, Jerry Lee Lewis, we talked about Eddie Cochran, we talked about Gene Vincent. Um, and I, at that point I said to you I was going to reserve discussion of Ricky Nelson and the Everly Brothers uh, for this week because they had hits that continued on into the, uh, on into the early 1960s and so they kind of crossed the boundary from the late 50s into the early 1960s. These rockabilly, as I call them, rockabilly popsters, that is a version of rockabilly that's um, uh, a little bit more um, influenced by the teen idol kind of imaging. It's a, a squeaky or clean kind of rockabilly image. Um, there's none of the kind of roughneck uh, troublemaker part of rockabilly uh, left at this point. It's, it's really a very, very sort of squeaky clean and, uh, and almost, as I say, a kind of another version of a safe Elvis. It's, it's Elvis, but without any of the kind of threatening or potentially problematic aspects uh, for parents uh, that Elvis Presley's original image would have presented. And one of the most important groups in this this new uh, sort of softer version of rockabilly are the Everly Brothers. And as I said before, the Everly Brothers go back into the 1950s and really are sort of contemporary with people like Buddy Holly uh, and Jerry Lee Lewis. Um, they have their roots in traditional country music of the Southeast and Appalachian singing that involves high harmony singing. And so that's, that's, that's a little bit where their distinctive uh, uh, vocal style comes from. They were signed to Acuff Rose publishers in Nashville. Remember we talked about them in the first week, Acuff Rose uh, uh, formed by Roy Acuff, and Roy Acuff and Fred Rose in Nashville as one of the most important publishers when Nashville became the center of country and western music. Uh, they were signed by Wesley Rose, the son of Fred Rose, who's now gotten into the family business, and they were very much, uh, they had a very strong advocate in Chet Atkins, the, the famous uh, country guitarist who was working at RCA at the time as a producer. In fact, produced some of those Elvis Presley sessions when Elvis moved from Sun uh, to RCA. Um, and so they, they were signed uh, to, uh, to Acuff Rose by Wesley Rose, and Wesley Rose promised them that if they signed with Acuff Rose, because they wrote their own songs too, uh, if they did, he would get them a recording contract, because they've been having a hard time getting a recording contract. Chet Atkins, for as much of a, a fan and an advocate of the Everly Brothers as he was, couldn't get him a deal at RCA. Um, and so uh, Rose gets them signed to Cadence Records in New York City, and that's who they record with for the balance of the 1950s. Their harmony singing that two-part sort of high harmony uh, singing that they do, the Everly Brothers, Phil and Don, um, is, uh, is extremely influential and really is their trademark. Uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney imitate uh, the Everly Brothers very, very often, and not just at the beginning of their careers, but whenever they're singing together, there's a certain amount of Phil and Don uh, going, in with, going on with John and Paul. Um, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, when they first uh, started out in the business, uh, actually had a, a, a single that made the charts in the late 1950s under the name Tom and Jerry, and for all intents and purposes, they were a kind of uh, Everly Brothers imitation act. Of course, we'll, we'll come back in a couple of weeks to Simon and Garfunkel and how they went from that in the late 1950s and reemerged in 1965, or 1964, 1965 with, with what they were doing. But anyway, Everly Brothers, extremely important and influential. Uh, some important songs from the late 1950s, Bye Bye Love, Wake Up Little Susie, All I Have to Do is Dream. All I Have to Do is Dream is a beautiful example of their harmony singing the two guys together. And then in the 60s, uh, when they shifted to another label, uh, Kathy's Clown, a number one hit in 1960, and When Will I Be Loved from 1960, a number eight hit, which actually was uh, covered by Linda Ronstadt back in the 1970s, and she actually got, I think got her, her, uh, her version of it got to number two then. Uh, anyway, the Everly Brothers are very, very important who had a kind of a, uh, they, they, they sort of formed the link between late 50s rockabilly and the period leading up to the Beatles all through that period from 60 through 63. Of course, Ricky Nelson, we, I promised to say a little bit more about Ricky Nelson because uh, uh, we talked about him in the in context of TV. As I said before, he was on the cast of the Ozzie and Harriet show. He was, in fact, the real son of Ozzie and Harriet, who were really married in real life. Um, and when Elvis first started to become famous in 56, 57, he, being on the show, uh, bragged to his girlfriend to try to impress her 
that um, he was going to be making a record too, just like Elvis. And she said, oh, that's great. Oh, I'm going to love to hear that. So then he went home and said, Dad, I need a little bit of help. Now, it turned out Ozzie Nelson, uh, as I mentioned before, was a band leader. He was way connected inside Los Angeles and, and the music business. I mean, let's face it, he had a hit television show that he was the mastermind of. And so he hooked it all up for his son uh, and got him into the studio with some good musicians and some good songwriters. Uh, and it wasn't long before Ricky Nelson was producing some pretty good records, uh, doing a pretty good job. It wasn't that he was untalented like we I sort of cast aspersions on some of the teen, teen idols. Ricky Nelson really had talent. Um, and so if you want to hear an, uh, an early instance of Ricky Nelson, uh, Believe What You Say is number f uh, four hit from 1958 um, is a pretty good example. Many of the songs were written by a classic rockabilly songwriting duo called Johnny and Dorsey Burdett, who also had their own, uh, their own rock and roll trio that, that made recordings that didn't sell nearly as well as these Ricky Nelson uh, records. He used a lot of the same musicians that Elvis used, Nashville musicians that Elvis used during his sessions, including a guitarist named James Burton, who's kind of a legendary rockabilly guitar player who later ended up playing with Elvis uh, during the Las Vegas years and um, oftentimes Elvis concert posters from, those, from that period, the late 60s, early 70s, we see Elvis Presley featuring James Burton. James Burton sort of cut his teeth on those Ricky Nelson recordings. The last person we should talk about with regard to rockabilly popsters is Roy Orbison. I mentioned last week that Roy was originally signed to Sun Records, but he didn't really have much big success, ooby dooby, maybe uh, that kind of thing. But then his career really took off when he signed to Monument Records, um, starting with Only the Lonely, a number two hit in 1960, and extending to Pretty Woman, which was a number one hit for him in 1964. Roy, a singer-songwriter who, um, who uh, uh, had an interesting sort of vocal approach that sometimes approached a kind of almost operatic vocal quality and Only the Lonely, there's a, what we might call in classical music, a kind of a cadenza very near the end where he goes up into a high falsetto, the music stops, and he does a, a kind of a flourish there that was really unlike anything anybody else was doing in pop music at the time. And of course, he was extremely influential in a lot of musicians that came after him, uh, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, uh, people like that. And so that's the story with the rockabilly popsters as they take the transition from the, what we might think of as the end of the first wave of rock and roll, the end of the 50s, and taken to this era that, era that is sort of more controlled by the, um, by the grown-ups in the room. They're, they soften the rockabilly sound, but are still able to have some, fairly con uh, some pretty convincing hits and some fantastic success. So let's turn now to Southern California and consider the origins and the first successes of surf music.